My name is Amira Osman, Professor in Architecture at the Shwan University of Technology. I also hold the position of Saatchi Chair in Spatial Transformation, Positive Change in the Built Environment. I am the editor of a new book series titled The Built Environment in Emerging Economies, City, Space and Transformation. The first volume of the book series published in 2020 is titled City, Space and Power. As we completed the text of the book, the COVID-19 crisis gripped the world and life as we know it changed. This unsettled us in major ways, yet it makes our work on citizen space even more profound and necessary. We may have amended something here or there, or given the work a slightly different focus, but the issues covered around inequity and lack of access to opportunity is without a doubt key to the debates around the virus. Let me explain why. Cities will most probably go through transformation in the post-COVID-19 era, especially as our first line of defense against this public health crisis will be in areas of poverty, with communities that have generally been excluded and urban practices that have been undocumented or labeled as informal. We have long been concerned about spatial segregation and its implications believing that cities need to be considered as whole ecosystems and not as fragmented pockets of wealth and poverty. We are now confronted with a situation where destinies are even more intertwined. A collapse in health or economic systems will affect everyone, irrespective of class or income. Sustainability, resilience and equity should be seen as synonymous and must go hand in hand. The lockdowns have exposed persistent spatial, economic and social inequities and the stark discrepancies globally and specifically in South Africa, where historical and spatial realities have further exacerbated the situation. This dysfunction is seen as an opportunity to implement change. We need to harness design to control the spread of the disease. In the absence of a treatment, an unreliable and uneven rollout of vaccines, changes in behavior and spatial measures are the only things we have control over. As built environment professionals, we need to go back to our drawing boards and reimagine a future that we feel very unprepared for. The values and concepts presented in this book are crucial in mapping a future for our cities that reduces vulnerability that is more egalitarian and that ensures that communities will never again find themselves in such precariousness when faced by disease or other forms of disaster. Our work on cities is more important today than it ever was. There are definite overlaps between the interests of the authors in this first volume of the book. Despite each handling the theme from different viewpoints and based on vastly different experiences. The mix of disciplines and interests of the authors, that being architecture, planning, governance, political and legal history, philosophy, religious and constitutional law, makes for an exciting text with diverse perspectives. The authors have similar beliefs, values and concerns, yet use different terminologies and frames of reference in addressing the issue of citizen power. All the authors offer, in one form or the other, a criticism of the contemporary production of urban space and cities. A democratic society is the main concern of Sanin Restrepo's theory of encryption, achieved through the unearthing of what is buried beneath the urban liberal semblance of legality and human rights. He states that the elite arranges the world through an organization of qualifications and hierarchies in order to access it and in the process denies access to others. Telfa interrogates the reproductions of racialized thinking and practice in South African university spaces and specifically within architectural learning sites. He asks that we demolish the myth of the rainbow nation and confront our discomfort. He challenges the notion of spatial transformation as merely another author discourse, which he believes is another way of avoiding uncomfortable socio-political analysis of the built environment discipline and can therefore be considered a limited discourse. 
I myself write about how citizens and their urban practices are labelled illegitimate, informal, outside of the law, leading to ex exclusionary policies and people being denied access to opportunities. I use my experiences from the Sudan and South Africa to reflect on these issues. While Morado Nascimento elaborates how the design and urban planning fields form a fragmented and binary language game, contaminated by power relations. She also suggests that it is through decrypting the reading, as opposed to diagnosing of the city, that exclusion may be reversed. To achieve this, the reading must be carried out through the eyes of those who occupy the city and not the gaze of professionals and authorities. The conversation that has taken place between the various authors has led to interesting and new perspectives in the field of cities and space and power. A synergy emerged between encryption and the phenomenology of space. Strong and fluid parallels emerged that could be pursued further, as did the concepts of unheard, marginalized and hidden people. Cities impact on whole nations. They have a powerful influence in a country's development. Principles of democracy and equity are many times established in cities and then exported and applied elsewhere. The relationship between cities nationally and internationally assists in creating networks that are beneficial in terms of the environment and better functioning socio-economic systems. Cities in emerging economies have unique characteristics which may help in creating a rich global dialogue. The built environment disciplines in emerging economies present unique opportunities for a discourse around the practical, political and symbolic elements of space, identity and culture. Cities need to accommodate all in all of our diversity, welcome all and be accessible to all. The four chapters presented in this book, though diverse in approach, are unified in values and they are presented without losing the individual voices of the authors as one cohesive narrative and an intellectual flow from the metaphysical and implications for understanding teaching and praxis. This volume and the book series take into consideration the relationship between emerging economies and developing contexts and lessons that may be shared between them. It presents a unique perspective and highlights issues not addressed much in writing on the built environment. It aims to explore the interface between the various built environment professions and to enhance the role of the built environment professions in the achievement of innovation and progress that is aligned with global agendas for city, construction and planning. These debates have global resonance, yet are particularly important for us in South Africa. Here, the built environment professions remain untransformed and disengaged. We need to rethink ways in which the built environment is conceived and developed. This book series will aim to promote thinking and alternative strategies for design, funding, management and procurement in the built environment. We apply a multidisciplinary approach towards understanding these complexities while at the same time encourage discipline-specific explorations. The connection between the built environment and economic development is emphasized. The built environment is seen to be embedded in local systems of education, production, skills and economies. The built environment comes to be and is sustained through complex and many times invisible processes of transaction, negotiation and deal-making. This connection is brought to the fore and helps contribute towards a conversation between similar socio-economic contexts in general and the global south in particular. Terminology and the historical and contemporary implications thereof is important, as are the implied power relationships between countries and continents, the global south and the west being two such terms. These distinctions no doubt assist in achieving a deeper understanding of the challenges that we faced. And in, in many cases, the economic realities of increased income and growth is coupled with uneven and highly unequal growth. 
Indeed, what is needed in these contexts is a reimagination of how growth may be aligned with conceptualizing built environments that are equitable, beautiful, and functional, increasing people's opportunities and offering people a better chance at improving lives and livelihoods. Various authors have already started to introduce concepts never before used in built environment debates, such as livability, lovability, integrity, inclusivity, harmony, respect, mutuality, reciprocity, fellowship, ethicality, responsibility, and humility. We hope that this book series helps reconceptualize this expectation of what countries of emerging economies are, how they may evolve with specific reference to the built environment. This is especially important because of the lacunae in data across the globe, an untested bias in interpretations on space, cities, and the built environment. Urban practices have been dismissed or undocumented in some cases, while value has been attributed to selected practices as opposed to others. The study of society and space has traditionally been biased to particular interpretations, employing techniques that render some people spaces and practices invisible and undervalued. Yet the Western assumptions of how built environments evolve and change over time are not always global or accurate. The publication offers a platform for voices that have been sidelined, excluded, and those that have remained unheard. It's important to consider who dominates the field, the publication field in general, and those that dominate the publication of journals and books on the built environment specifically. New publications such as this one will contribute towards achieving the transformative agendas, as documented in various policies, national, global, and institutional agendas.